it's really great to see so many familiar and some unfamiliar faces who care so much about South Africa. Um, my name is John Taves. I'm the uh, chair of the Comparative History of Ideas program. And I would like to welcome all of you to the seminar, a rather large seminar in our terminology, with Yazir Henry, veteran of the underground military wing of the anti-apartheid movement and currently a peace activist, uh, director of the Direct Action Center for Peace and Memory. Um, you'll find some of the brochures for his center outside, and I'm sure he'll be happy if you pick them up and think about donating some money to his organization. Uh, I would like to thank the College of Arts and Sciences and the Graduate School for providing the grant to the James Klaus Center for Conflict and Dialogue Studies, which made this visit possible. A fuller introduction to Yazir will follow in a minute, but I would first like to say a few brief words about the Klaus Center, uh, since this seminar in many ways represents its official public inauguration. During the academic year 2001-2002, Jim Klaus led a group of 30 UW undergraduates on an exploratory and educational journey through three deeply divided societies, Northern Ireland, South Africa, and Cyprus, in order to examine the themes of memory and identity, conflict and dialogue. From this program, there quickly emerged a cluster of thematically related activities in the Comparative History of Ideas program that we now refer to in a kind of shorthand as post-conflict studies. In the wake of Jim's premature and tragic death in March 2004, we thought it would be fitting to constitute a publicly visible focal point for these activities in a center named after him, a place for interdisciplinary conversation about conflict and dialogue, and for the organization of projects and practices that would mobilize individuals to address the problems and and of post-conflict cultural integration, civic peace, and social justice, both locally and globally. An academic center, of course, cannot replace the constant proliferation of grassroots uh, and student-initiated acti activities that Jim originally inspired. It's a name we use to honor his legacy in what we do. Uh, Jim's wife is here. Erin, I won't make you stand up. Uh, we're happy to see her here. Uh, Theron Stevenson, the CHID Director of International Programs and Exchanges, was a student on that, that now almost legendary journey of 2001-2002, and it was during that trip that he and many others first met Yazir Henry. Theron has also been the primary organizer and coordinator of this visit, and he will introduce our guest from Cape Town. Before he does that, I should say that there will be a reception in Parrington Hall after the meeting in the commons. I don't know if any of you know it. It's in the second floor of the building, which is just back there, the old, old, one of the older buildings on campus. Um, and also, I, I would like to point out again the, the brochures in front, which also include some other CHID activities that you might, want, might be interested in. Aaron. One more quick announcement. If we could ask everybody to turn off the ringers on their cell phones, we would quite appreciate that. So this is great. I'm so glad you're all here. Um, the last time I spoke before an audience in Kane Hall, I was singing a song at a, a Jim Klaus memorial service. So it feels good and feels appropriate to be here the next time uh, inaugurating the, the speaker seminar uh, that's named after Jim. Um, I'd also like to thank the students in the, the Peace and Conflict reading group that helped me organize this whole event. Um, these students have educated themselves and they've educated me by presenting on books and articles and organizations that they've researched in the areas of conflict and peace building. And they did a lot of work to help set up tonight. So, uh, so thank you to Mark Baumforth, Haley Bavese, uh, Midge Brenner, Colleen Campbell, Jessica Enzi, Aditya Ganapathiraju, Greg Geyer, Jennifer Green, Hilary Holman, Brendan Impson, uh, Ruth Marshall, Natalia Martinez Paz, Cameron Summers, and Carol Weber. You guys have been great. Um, so it's no easy task to introduce Yazir Henry. Um, this is a, a man whose life is shaped by his insistence upon defining himself. Um, he and his fellow soldiers who uh, joined the liberation force known as Umkonto Wesizwe, which is Spear of the Nation, 
They refused to adopt the identities that were assigned to them by the apartheid government. This was a government that concocted a wide range of identities that they used to define people with brown skin, all of which amounted to less than white. Um, but by the actions of soldiers like Yazir, and by the negotiations of people like Archbishop Desmond Tutu and Nelson Mandela, and by the pressure of, of multinational corporations and, and world governments who were finally brought into the light, in 1994, the oppressive apartheid regime was dismantled and put down. So that's a good thing. <laughs> <laughs> um, but despite a popularly, a popularly elected government, apartheid does still exist in South Africa. Uh, this is a place where, for some people, simply sitting down to drink a cup of coffee in a restaurant is a provocative political act. Um, it's not an exaggeration. Uh, so now, as the director of the Direct Action Center for Peace and Memory, Yazir Henry works with his comrades to claim their space in the world, to own their own histories. And one of the ways that they do this is by taking groups of students on journeys of remembrance throughout Cape Town, visiting places that mark the history of their liberation struggle, even if these histories have been left out of the official narrative of reconciliation and redemption in South Africa. So I met Yazir on one of these journeys of remembrance in the winter of 2002 when I was studying with the Identity, Memory, Conflict, and Dialogue program. Uh, there are a few others from that program in this room, and I'm glad to see them. Um, but I've wanted to meet Yazir again ever since then. Um, it was a moving experience. The tour was quite powerful, and our meeting with Yazir was enlightening and challenging. It was enlightening because after sharing his story of struggle and of survival, he told us that we helped him by listening. And it was challenging because he reminded us that simply listening is not enough. So. When you ask one of our students who has met Yazir, what is Yazir like, a typical response would be, um, I don't know, man. <laughs> He's intense. <laughs> so I believe, I believe he was a bit horrified to learn that this is the one word we used to describe him <laughs> when he met with our class yesterday at dinner. And, uh, and we found that, in fact, Yazir is many things beyond simply intense. He's engaging. Um, He's funny, he's curious. Uh, he also proved himself capable of quoting in a truly intellectual way Gordon Lightfoot's song, The Wreck of the Edmund Fitzgerald, no less than twice in the past two days, <laughs> which I find quite impressive. Um, and uh, so we explained to Yazir that we find him intense because he holds people accountable for the things that they say. And as Seattleites, we're used to being able to exchange pleasantries or thoughts that don't mean much or require us to follow up. Um, actually, I don't think this is really a Seattle thing. I, I think it would be wonderful if all across our country and across the world, more people, more administrators, more politicians were held accountable for the things that they say. Um, so we can expect Yazir to elicit such clarity from you, from us, uh, during the question and answer period that will follow his talk tonight. And we can expect him to be clear and unflinching while he shares his stories and his ideas with us. And it isn't enough simply to listen. Stories of struggle and survival have a purpose. And if we ask for these stories, we must incorporate, the, we must incorporate that purpose into our own actions, into our teaching, into our writing, into our work, into our voting, etc. These histories do not belong to us. They belong to the people who live them. So now to tell his story, ladies and gentlemen, Yazir Henry. I had learned the cards there.
So it, it is daunting, so I'm a bit worried about that and flinching a bit. Um, so don't mind me if I end up flinching once in a while. Uh, I'm a long way from home. Um, yeah, where it's easier to just be. Um, I want to say thank you for introducing me in such a respectful and affirming manner. I want to greet everyone here tonight, students, staff, faculty, friends, colleagues, and people. So when I met uh, Jim Close, I didn't um, think that I'd be standing here at his, at this, yeah, in this way. So um, I wanted to say thank you for, for coming. Um, and even if I just met him briefly, you know, uh, he touched me and I know that uh, he was a special man. Now, my talk tonight, as all my talks, um, as always when I speak and have the opportunity to speak, is dedicated to young combatants. Young people on the African continent and elsewhere, young people who have found themselves caught up in the wars of the governments, and young people who are already at war, sometimes before they are born. Those who learn war through the umbilical cords of their mothers. It is to them that I dedicate my words tonight. to young men and young women, dead and those alive, to those who fought, died, and to those who survived, to those who are still fighting, and especially to the dead that we will remember tomorrow. I want also to acknowledge young activists who have fought and who are fighting to end these type of wars. I wish to acknowledge those who struggle for peace when that struggle is romance. And I especially want to acknowledge those activists who struggle for peace when the struggle for peace is beyond romance and has become life in itself. To young people who have recognized in themselves the courage that to make a difference is to act. Sometimes the action that all the peoples are too stuck, too afraid, or too harmed to make. So I want to give voice to the experience of this generation of my country as they speak to new and other generations that follow. Socially, after conflict, there's oftentimes haste to forget. Not only to forget the conflict, but also to forget those who viscerally 
viscerally remind us of what we have just done. So to the human beings who by mere living become our social conscious without having asked to, both in the symbolic and in the flesh, Last month, the 10th anniversary of the South African Truth and Reconciliation Commission, and many of us flying across the world to speak of it, small and big alike, happy and angry alike. Twelve years, as you have said, of our democracy, 12 years after 350 years of resistance and fighting, with guns, without them, with pens, with ink, with songs, with bodies. For me, when talking about my country's experience, the challenge is always to maintain my focus on the celebration. The celebration of life, of survival, of resistance, but especially the celebration of victory. And a victory that carries hope, that carried the hope, that drove people like me and others beyond what we ourselves at times thought was humanly possible. But I do not want to forget the pain. In fact, I refuse to forget the pain. And I refuse because I have no choice not to forget it. I cannot forget the abjection, the toil, and the struggle that most people ordinary in my country face every day as normality. But as I've said, I do not want to just get lost in it. I want to balance this reality of objection and sometimes of oblivion with the hope and the strength and the laughter of what it means to also be victorious they live together on the same slate, negative and positive, circle and triangle. Now, some people sometimes talk to me and ask me about having cheated death. Now, I want to say I cannot talk about the cheating of death since I don't know death personally. If I did, I would not be here. In Seattle, or just here in front of the podium, looking and feeling the pounding of my heart and the racing of my blood. But I have, however, lived alongside and in close proximity to death. And I've seen death. I've seen it happening to others. And I felt it happening to others. So my responsibility is to have balance, double-sided, double-edged.
the last generation of soldier, survivor, resistor, with my responsibility as the first generation of soldier, survivor, peace builder. And in that I have to explore what it means to have peace, its fragility, what the difference is between the larger peace process that we study and the smaller processing of peace that live on our bodies that's evidenced in the lines of our skin as people and all the things that make us human. Now each time I've given the I'm given this privilege of voice, of speech and of sharing, I feel in my body also the privilege of breath and breathing. So tonight, I wish to speak to you here about my life as well as what makes me human and the context in which humans such as ourselves live. My talk will sway backwards and forwards between the personal and the political, between the macro and the micro, between the activist and the intellectual, but mainly between the human and the historical the now and the yesterday, and that middle point that allows its rocking backwards and forwards called the present. Today, this moment, this minute. And I want to speak about, about it with hope, and I hope that hopefully will give meaning to an experience of so many ordinary men and women like me and others across the world who don't often easily get the opportunity or who are not easily able to speak about what life means to live daily. And for this opportunity, I'm immeasurably thankful to youth Darren to you, John, to Doug Merrill, uh, and to Jim Close, and all others who have made my travel across the world possible. Now, I know many has of you have been to my country, and I must probably assume that many of you have not. Some of you might be from it. <laughs> 